The presidential candidates participating in the 25th of February elections have signed a second peace accord. The presidential candidate of the All Progressive Congress, APC Bola Tinubu, who did not attend the first peace signing, attended the signing alongside his running mate, Kashim Shetima, and APC Chairman Abdullahi Adamu. Now, other candidates that attended the signing included Omoele Shoure of the African Action Congress, Rabiu Konkoso of the New Nigeria People's Party, NNPP, and others. The candidates of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Atiku Abubakar, and that of Labour Party, Peter Obi, did not attend the event. However, the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress, Omoele Shore, has again forced the idea of signing peace pacts ahead of the 2023 election, querying whether Nigeria and other candidates are at war. Now, he also accused some Nigerian governors of inciting violence during the electioneering period. Well, joining us to discuss this uh, tonight is Professor Richard Wokocha. He is a professor of law at the River State University. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us and good evening. Thank you. Good evening and happy new year to you again. Yeah, happy new year. Um, uh, it, it's interesting that Omoyele Shoure is raising this um, case against governors um, because half the time when peace accords are being signed, um, mostly signed by presidential candidates, um, now if you do see it being signed in states, it's because there had been previous um, issues of violence. Um, but in this case, let's start from the states and then walk our way up to the federal. Um, I have seen peace, um, a peace accord being signed in River State at some point during the elections, and that was because of several, um, you know, warring um, factions within and without parties. But what is the veracity or the, the binding, uh, or how binding are these peace pacts? Does it have any impact? Does it, um, does it have any repercussions if they be broken whatsoever? Or are they just... Um, uh, let's say some form of, uh, you know, formality that's being done just so that it looks like, hey, we all want peace here, even though uh, in the back end, somebody might be fueling some form of violence. Well, going by um, our history, uh, electoral history, uh, what has been obvious is that in virtually all the elections have been acts of violence um, perpetrated by persons uh, acting for parties, one party or the other. Um, so if you're asking whether um, this signing of peace accords are useful instruments, I think it has become a ritual for us. Um, as Samuele rightly pointed out, signing of peace accords indicates that there is a war or there is an insurrection of some, of some form. And you're getting warring parties to agree um, to end the hostilities or end the war. And, and so it's first and foremost an odd thing to do uh, in a run-up to election. I mean, elections are, are serious national uh, civil issues that citizens express their choice of candidates and prepare their states uh, to be run and administered by the next administration. So uh, the question will be, why are you calling truce? Why the war? But again, as I said, our experience has shown that in every election, there has been acts of violence. And uh, the question remains, what has been the consequence of those acts of violence, those breaches of um, uh, those social agreements uh, we call uh, peace accords? Uh, no effect, no consequence uh, for those breaches. And so uh, one cannot help but uh, agree that... Uh, there are rituals that are not really useful, that do not contribute to the peaceful conduct of the election at the end of the day. So the fact that you, you, you and I have, you know, looked at the fact that they may just be normal rituals that have to be done before an election or electioneering process. Let's look at the state of the nation as we speak. Um, we had in the past few weeks another kidnap case where people were taken from a train um, somewhere in a dose state. As we speak, INEC facilities are still being burned. People are being killed. Um, last week, if I'm not mistaken, a priest was burned to death. Um, I mean, literally, so many acts of insecurity, violence. Um, I, I, this morning, I heard somebody asking the INEC um, voter education chairman, um, Fessus, um, um, if the elections will really be holding in those places where their facilities have been destroyed 
and some, some materials also gone with, you know, the arson. Um, but the question that was continuously lingering in my mind was, what, where are the consequences for these actions? And, and, and why, because there was, a, there was an INEC office that was attacked twice in a row. And one would wonder, if this has happened before, what were the, the, the things that were put in place to, to make sure that this does not happen again? But then it did happen again. So how seriously are we taking this issue of election violence, pre-election uh, violence, or even election violence on the day of election? And who's to say that um, it will be a safe atmosphere for us to go out and vote, aside from just doing the ritual of signing peace pact? There is the usual ritual um, of um, election day when the police, um, a day or two to the election, when uh, a large number of uh, uh, co contingents of their um, agency uh, to different parts of the country. That takes place. Uh, but our experience shows that that deployment of officers has not in any way stopped the perpetration of acts of violence. And what is more serious and more important to me is the fact that those acts go unchallenged. Now, every business is a business. I have consistently said, including on this, on this particular media, I have consistently said that when a business goes without consequence, more investors will be attracted into the business. We have consistently had elections marred by violence Perpetrators of the violence or sponsors of those violence have had free time going into office and running through the office. There has been no consequence. The boys were not arrested. Nobody has ever been convicted for electoral violence. People get killed. Nothing is done about it. Electoral officers get killed. Police officers get killed. And nothing is done about it. Nobody pays for it. So what makes you think the next election will not bring something worse? Um, uh, definitely, parties will prepare as if they are going to war, and so you will see uh, the acts of violence that we've been witnessing in our election. Uh, it, it is worrisome, and um, I think uh, we need to focus mainly on that question. Why does crime in election time in Nigeria not attract punishment? Because that is what is causing that business to thrive. That's what is causing it to increase. I'm curious. Why are we going to punish them? Yes. Um, I, I, while, we, while we all need answers to that question, I, I recently um, spoke to the, the Electoral Commissioner um, in um, uh, Kenya. Um, who they, they just recently had the elections, I think, um, late last year. And for the first time in the history of Kenya, that election was not marred by violence as usual. And I was curious to pick his brains as to uh, what they did um, that helped them to, you know, douse the tension. And he gave me an array of, I mean, they, they broke it down and how they strategically worked with security agencies, CSOs, the people, the, lo the lo people at the local levels. And, and, and we know that Nigeria, we always go to these countries and observe their elections. Why is it so difficult for us to borrow a lift from these people? Because I'm guessing that what, what I heard from the INEC com or the Electoral Commissioner in Nairobi was not necessarily a, a hidden secret. It was not top secret. It was not a security thing. Um, it's, it's public. It was made public. So I'm wondering if someone like former President um, Goodluck Jonathan was there to observe the elections, why are we not learning something from a country like Kenya? We're not talking about the US now, but Kenya. Why is it so difficult for us to you know, absorb these things and make it happen? Or is there somebody who's benefiting from this violence? <laughs> I think it, that would be a rhetorical question because every act of violence during election in Nigeria has been sponsored. Um, in many cases, they are targeted against specific persons. Um, our experience shows that in any state in which uh, one party is in control, the bulk of the viol acts of violence are targeted against the other parties uh, in opposition in that state. And uh, it goes unpunished. So there is no act of violence in Nigerian electoral um, uh, process uh, that comes from nowhere for no reason. Uh, they are all sponsored, and those who are behind them benefit maximally. We have yet not been able to discover how to make them pay. 
for violating the law, um, Section 227 of the Electoral Act, that provides that there shall be no, no paramilitary organization or organizing of people, whether you call it committee, organs, or whatever, uh, to engage in acts of violence or acts that will cause apprehension. But look around the country, even now, as we are, we are days away from the presidential election, you have party committees organized to pull out uh, posters of uh, other parties in the states uh, to bring down their billboards and uh, all manner of such things. Organized. And these things are done publicly. You see video clips of them. The faces are known. In some cases, local government chairmen mandated by their uh, party leaders uh, within the area carry out these things on camera. And there is no consequence. Mm. In clear breach of the law. So, I mean, we cannot say uh, whether somebody is benefiting. They are directly organized for the purposes of making the organizers benefit. So does, but yet, th does this also, I one way or the other, have a blowback on our judiciary? Because does it mean because we have laws? I don't. I, I don't think that we're in shortage of laws in this country. Is it that we're afraid to test these laws, or we're just turning a blind eye? In, in conclusion, I, I think, I think uh, we we run into the uh, trap of uh, giving a very light definition to violence in elections. Um, by using the clause we have always used in judicial activities of uh, there was substantial uh, compliance, therefore the election is valid. If we had taken the other route of invalidating an election because it violated, the conduct violated the law governing the process, parties would have organized themselves better and would have avoided that, which will lead to um, the striking down of their quote-unquote electoral victory achieved through violation of the Electoral Act. So I think, yes, we do have problem with uh, the very light interpretation we have given to acts of violence in election, and uh, it has enabled uh, the gladiators in that sector to turn the law directly upside down and to benefit from it without consequence. Well, I, I, would, I would have loved to continue to have this conversation, but unfortunately, time is not on our side. But I want to say thank you. Uh, professor Richard Aduche Wokocha is a professor of law at the River State University, and it's always a pleasure to have these conversations with you, Professor. Great pleasure. Thank Thanks you for, for having me. All right. Well, that's it on the show tonight on Plus Politics. It's a brand new week, but we will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. same time. And don't forget, go get your PVC because we're on the last lap. If you haven't collected your PVC, go get it right now. Go back to your ward or where you registered and pick it up. That's your passport to a new Nigeria. I'm Mary Anakon. Have a good evening.